Good morning, everybody. Um, well, man, you, I, I know you had a good breakfast, but uh, it doesn't help me out too much to fill all your bellies with biscuits and gravy right before uh, I'm getting ready to speak. So midway through the sermon, we may have to stand up and do some jumping jacks or something to kind of re-engage. But um, I'm glad that you're here this morning again. Um, I just to say briefly that I'm thankful uh, to be here with you for this weekend, and I'm um, I think it's very important that you're placing the emphasis on um, having a time to focus on uh, what it means to be a man of God and, and focus on um, having a men's weekend. It's a really important thing. So as we begin this session this morning, we're going to pick up where we left off with uh, the session last night, if you were with us. Uh, if not, I understand that these have been recorded and I think probably are available on the website. Is that correct? Am I right there? So you can probably pick up the, the previous lesson from last night if you choose to. Um, but uh, tonight, today, uh, the lesson I have to share will stand on its own, but build from last night. So last night, what we basically focused in on is that God has given a mandate for men. And that mandate is found in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28, that God wants us to, to reflect His image in the world as creators and cultivators. And to create and cultivate means that we are to be responsible men in the world to go out and to be men that work and have responsibility over the stewardship and managerial tasks of this earth. And also we're to create not only work, but to create relationships and to co cultivate those well. We have been hardwired to create and to cultivate and to do so especially with investing in close relationships. So that's the way we were designed to be. That's what we saw last night. But in order to really understand what it means to be an authentic man, we need to really construct a good definition of what it means to be a man. Now the definition for manhood that I'm going to share with you again, I'm leaning upon the material from, uh, from the series uh, 33, um, The Quest for Authentic Manhood. And in that material, which is fantastic material that, I, that I'm leaning upon and I want to give credit to today, they try to reconstruct a definition for what it means to be a man by going back to Genesis and by looking at uh, the first man, Adam. So we're going to be going back to Genesis again this morning, but not only will we go back to Genesis and look at the first man, Adam, but we're going to compare and contrast him with the, what the Bible calls the second Adam. Jesus Christ is referred to in the passage we're going to look at this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as the second Adam. Now, whenever we contrast these two, the first Adam and the second Adam, the reality is every man walks in the shadow of one of these two men. And the question that you and I need to be asking ourselves as we reconstruct a definition of what it really means to be a man is whose shadow am I walking in? Am I walking in the dark shadow cast by the first Adam or am I walking in the light that is being projected by the second Adam. So in order to, to, to do that, we need to look at this text this morning. If you want to be following along in your Bible from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, let me share this with you. This is verses um, 45 to 47, the words of the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. He says this, and now this, this, this portion of what Paul says is, is in the midst of the discussion of the, the truthfulness of the Christian resurrection. And in the midst of that, he says, So it is written, verse 45, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. Now, let's, let's take just one moment here and contrast the first Adam, that is, 
Adam, the first man made that was in the Garden of Eden, and contrast him with the second Adam, which is Jesus Christ. First, the first Adam. This text says he was a living being. Now you go back and you look at the opening chapters of Genesis and you find that God uh, decided to create the first human being and he fashioned out of the dust of the earth a clay man. And into that clay man, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the Spirit of God gave an animating force to that clay man and he became a living soul, a living being. So the first Adam is a living being and he, he has his origin from the earth being made of dust. And you look at the way the first Adam began to live his life in the garden and you discover that Adam's manhood was based on instinct, reason, and reaction. And he began to focus and as we see in chapter 3, upon himself being a self-made man, a self-willed man, and even a self-centered man as he falls into sin and begins to blame his wife for his own transgression. So, the first Adam is a living being made from the earth, made from the dust, that's based on instinct, reason, and reaction, focusing upon himself. But the second Adam, Jesus this text says, is a life-giving spirit. Not just a living being. It's, it, there's, it's one thing to be alive, and it's another thing to be alive. All human beings have life in them. And you can walk through life and, and, ha and, and you know, have air in your lungs and be, technically have a pulse, but be dead on the inside. God doesn't want you to just live. He wants you to experience life. And those are two drastically different things. Adam, the first Adam, if you're living your life in his shadow, you're walking around and yeah, you have a pulse. Yeah, you got a heartbeat. Yeah, you breathe. But are you walking around just empty? Not really alive. The second Adam was a life-giving spirit. Jesus Christ is not just from the earth, but this text says He's from heaven. And the second Adam, Jesus, His definition of manhood is more than just reaction to the circumstances around Him based on instinct and reason, but instead He is deeply intentional about His life, He's spiritually focused, and he breathes life into the relationships of people around him by vitalizing their life, by being a life-giving spirit. So, so, so picture this. The first Adam, if you're following in his steps, you walk through life as a shadow, thinking life is really about you, and you're always letting life happen to you, and you're just simply reacting and responding to what is the circumstances around you and you're kind of a drain on resources and upon people. But the second Adam, Jesus, if you're following in His steps, you actually are understanding your purpose as a man, as a spiritual leader, as an influencer. And you step into situations and say, I'm going to try to breathe life into this situation and try to pour into rather than just take from and be a life-giving spirit. So if we compare the life of Adam, the first man, with that of Jesus, the second Adam, the second man, we're going to see some pretty dramatic contrasts. And, and so we're going to do that here for the next few moments. We're going to contrast the first Adam and the way he lived his life and responded to certain situations and contrast that with Jesus, the second Adam. And by doing this contrast analysis, we're going to be able to then draw some conclusions that will help us to build a, a definition of what it really means to be an authentic man, what it means to be masculine, what it means to, be, uh, to experience manhood. Now, this definition has four distinctive parts, 
And so we're going to look at each one of them in turn. And so I'm going to give you a part of the definition, and then we're going to affirm the definition by looking at contrasting the first atom with the second atom. And we'll do that with each one, and then we'll build the definition and close at the end of the session today with a pretty secure definition of what it means to be a man. And we need this because culture is sending us so many mixed messages, especially today, and men are confused about what it means to be a man. I mean, does being a man mean that I know how to run a chainsaw and change a tire and I walk around like John Wayne? Or does being a man mean uh, that, uh, that I'm in touch with my feelings? I mean, what does, what does being a man mean? We need a good, de compelling definition for what manhood is all about. So let's look at each part of the definition. The first one is authentic men reject passivity. Reject passivity. Now, Adam was passive in the garden. If you go back to Genesis 3 and you see where the serpent is having a conversation with Eve and he is luring her to um, be uh, in defiance of God's one restrictive command to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The serpent comes to her and, and begins to cast seeds of doubt in her mind as to whether or not she can really trust the goodness of God, or is God really holding something back from you? Can, can I really believe that God has my best interest at heart? And, she, and, and, and she, the serpent begins to say, you're not going to die if you eat from this tree. And so she is enticed. And in verse number 6, it says, The woman saw the fruit of the tree, that it was good for food, it was pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. And she took some of it and ate it. Now let me pause there just a moment. When you envision that in your mind, I don't know what kind of picture you paint. I mean, do you see... The, like a lush garden paradise? Do you see this tree that's maybe on a little knoll in the midst of the garden that's beaming with light because it's, that's the tree that's the forbidden tree, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Do you see a serpent? I don't know how you picture this. Do you see a serpent in its branches? Do you see this pomegranate-like fruit hanging from the branch? And, and Eve seeing the enticing nature of the fruit and reaching to get it. Do you picture that? But I don't know what you picture in your mind's eye, but, I, but here's the question. As this is happening, where is Adam? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, is he in another part of the garden somewhere, cultivating a tree, or is he having a conversation with some other animal over there in a corner? I mean, where is he? We don't have to wonder because the text tells us in the last part of verse number 6, she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate it. He was right there. He was standing right there the whole time. Being passive. He's present, but checked out. Standing silent as Eve is tempted. Do you realize that men today, all of us, we are still tempted to be that way? To stand idly by. We're still plagued with passivity. I tell you, one of the places where I, I, I see this in my, I'm tempted with this in my own life. You know, I've worked a hard day at the job. I mean, I've worked all day long. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, I'm exhausted and I want to come home and sit down and check out. And my kids are clamoring for attention and they need some, some focus. And I can be tempted to just completely be passive and let all the craziness happen 
and think, you know what? That's my wife's job to deal with these kids. Just be passive. I can stand idly by as a man in the world in which I live with injustice happening all around me, with the poor and those that are, that are in need not being taken care of, with racism happening right in front of my face and just be completely passive in the world, just standing there. And what am I doing if I do that? I'm standing in the shadow of the first man, Adam. And that's not authentic, men. Now contrast that with Jesus. Jesus, unlike Adam in the garden who stood idly by being passive, Jesus rejected passivity. In Jesus, we see real manhood. He wasn't passive. Instead, he shows what it means to be masculine by taking the initiative for the benefit of other people around him. Uh, turn, if you'd like to look, I'm going to make reference here to Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, the Bible gives us insight into how Jesus was so um, masculine that he was unwilling to stand idly by when there was something that needed to be done. Again, I don't know what you picture in your mind's eye of, uh, and, and in fact we can't really know, but just for the purposes of stimulating our imagination, think for just a moment of what it must have been like in heaven when God is there on His throne and He's in his, with His divine counsel with all of the angelic spiritual beings. And He looks through heaven and says, we need someone to go and rescue the human race because the love, of, the love that is within me is so compelled to rescue those of my human creation that are, were made in my image that have fallen into sin and darkness and we've got to find a way to rescue them. Who will go? Who among us will go. I mean, is Jesus standing there with his hands in his proverbial pockets, checked out and passive? Not at all. Jesus, the very Son of God, rejects passivity to this point. Philippians 2, begin at verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the form, the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He was willing to leave the glories of heaven, set aside the privileges that were rightfully his, and come here and be proactive and take the initiative to the point of, of being taking the form of a servant for all of us and even laying down his life. Why? Because he saw something that needed to be solved and he stepped up and he led the way. Because real men reject passivity. He saw what needed to be done and he did it. Now that, that, that's, that's part of our definition for what it means to be a man. You want to follow in the in the light of the second Adam, Jesus, and reject passivity rather than just checking out and standing idly by like the first Adam. Now, um, there's lots of applications here. When you see something that needs to be done at home, at work, in the church, are you just standing idly by? Or are you being a man and rejecting passivity and taking the initiative and acting when something needs to be taken care of? That's our first part of our definition. Reject passivity. That's what it means to be a man. But secondly, there's a second part of the, of the definition. Authentic men will accept responsibility. Now, Adam failed here too. The first Adam did, the first man. Because God gave Adam at least three responsibilities in the Garden of Eden. And of these three responsibilities, he failed at every point. Now, what responsibilities did God give him? Um, they might be summarized this way. God gave Adam a will to obey. He gave him a work to do. 
and he gave him a woman to love. Now let's look at each one of those. First of all, God gave the responsibility of Adam of a will to obey. God came to Adam and he said, he created this garden and with all of these trees, and he says to Adam, enjoy this place. Enjoy this garden and cultivate it. But don't eat from that one tree. You can have everything. Everything, I mean, it was unlimited. It was limitless. There was unlimited possibilities. Anything, anything and everything is yours for your enjoyment. With one small exception. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He gave him a will to obey. The question is, will you be responsible, Adam? Responsible with the will of God. Will you obey it or reject it? Secondly, he gave him a work to do. He said to Adam, I want you to name all of these animals. I want you to, to cultivate and work the ground of the garden, and I want you to subdue the earth and rule over it. And he fails here as well, because we see in his sinfulness, he's not cultivating the way that he should have, but instead, he's cursed and ruled over by the very dirt he was supposed to cultivate, and to, to the point that we all return back to dust from which we came. Thirdly, he gives him a woman to love. He gives him a companion to protect and share his life with. But what does he do? He's standing idly by. He's not protecting his wife Eve, the woman that he is to love. And he fails on that point too as she reaches to take from that tree that was forbidden. So these are three specific areas of responsibility that were given to Adam and three specific areas of responsibility that are given to all men. God gives you and me a will to obey. He gives us a work to do. And he, if we're married... He gives us a woman to love. Are we going to be responsible in these three areas? But now look at Jesus and compare how Adam failed in all three areas of responsibility, and yet Jesus, interestingly enough, acted in all three of these areas and accepted responsibility in all three. First of all, more than just the will of God, the first Adam didn't desire the will of God, he desired the fruit. But look at the fruit that Jesus desired. In John chapter 4 and verse 34, Jesus says this. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Adam desired the food of the tree more than the food of the will of God. But yet the second Adam, Jesus, accepts the responsibility of the will of God and says, that's my real food is to follow God's will. And so he acts and is responsible in the first area, the second area. Jesus says in John 17 and verse number 4 that um, there is a work. We must work the works of God, who is, the Father who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no person can work. And Jesus accepts this work. He accepts it to the point that he would say toward the end of his life, here in John 17, 4, he would say, Father, he prays to the Father and he says, Father, I have completed, I have accomplished the work that you gave me to do. So Jesus fulfills his responsibility and accepts the work to, that was given him to do by his Father. And then thirdly, you say, wait a minute, a woman to love? Absolutely. Husbands, Love your wives the way Christ loved His bride, the church. Jesus loved, Jesus was given a woman to love, the church, to the point that He loved her so much that He was willing to give His life for her. Ephesians 5 and verse 25. So in, rather than walking in the shadow of the first Adam and and failing at responsibility. An authentic man follows in the light of Jesus and accepts responsibility in the three areas of the will to obey, the work to do, and the woman to love. And so authentic men accept this responsibility. Thirdly, as we build this definition, authentic men also lead courageously. Now look at the way that, um, that the first Adam failed to lead in the garden the way that he should have. 
Back in Genesis 2 and verse 16, this is before the, the creation of Eve. In chapter 2 and verse 16, God says to Adam and to Adam alone, you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's before Eve ever came along. So how does Eve come to know that that tree is something they shouldn't eat from? Maybe God revealed it to her at some unrecorded time. That's entirely possible. But it's also equally likely that the reason Ad, that Eve knew not to eat from that tree is because Adam told her, here's what God has said. So Adam knew the will of God. He may have very well communicated the will of God to his wife Eve, and yet when she is tempted in, in the garden, in Adam's presence, he fails to lead courageously. Again, he's being passive. He doesn't accept his responsibility. And if you're being passive and you're not being responsible, then you're not going to take the lead courageously. And so Adam fails at that point. But now look at the second Adam. Jesus led courageously by providing direction for people around him. Jesus, you see this in his life, he invites his disciples in Matthew 4 and verse 19, come and follow me. That's a pretty bold thing to say to somebody, to say, follow me. The only, the only way you can say that is if you are a courageous leader. And Jesus could say it. He was able to invite other people the way that we ought to be able to likewise invite people, like in the words of Paul. Paul would say to his, some of his readers in his epistles, he would say, follow me as I follow Christ. Can you and I say that? Can we boldly encourage other people around us to follow our example in so much as we are following Christ? Can we be the leaders, are we the leaders, by example to our wives, to our children, to our co-workers, to our neighbors? Are we leading courageously that way? Jesus, the second Adam, provided protection for others. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, and the sheep know my voice and they follow me. And Jesus shows that he is, is like the sheep herder who is providing protection in the fold for his sheep. And not only is he providing protection for those that he is leading courageously, but he's breathing life into them. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, he not only leads them, but he doesn't just lead them like a tyrant. He leads them in a way that is breathing life for them to see their capability and the possibilities of what they can become. He says in John 10 and verse 10, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full, have it in abundance. So Jesus, unlike the first man who failed to lead in the garden, Jesus, the second Adam, if we're walking in His steps, will lead courageously by providing direction for those around us. Now, fourth and finally, authentic men don't just reject passivity and accept responsibility and lead courageously, but we must be men who invest eternally. Look at Adam's focus. In the garden, Adam is investing in things that are temporary. And I think this is a glaring difference between the second Adam, Jesus, and the first Adam in the garden. And it shows a dramatic difference between the two different paths that all men take. We all take one of two different paths. The first Adam chose the things that would satisfy him in the moment. He wasn't thinking long game. He's only focused on the immediate. That's not authentic manhood. That's being a consumer. That's being, yeah, you may be a male, but you're just being a boy. If you're so short-sighted to just think about what is right immediately in front of you and satisfying the desires and needs of the moment. Jesus, on the other hand, as the second Adam, as a better Adam, Jesus invests in the eternal. He had an eternal perspective. He says in Matthew 6 and verse 19, 
He says, don't lay up treasure on earth where moth and rust can corrupt and destroy, where thieves break through and steal, but instead take the long view and invest in and lay up treasure in heaven where it's not, you're not going to lose it. It's not going to be corrupted. It's not going to slip through your fingers. I mean, in the end, we all know this, but I don't know how often we think of it. At the end of the day, what really matters? So many things that we think are the urgent in life that demand our immediate attention, the things that we clamor for in the, in the temporary to satisfy the desires of the moment, all of these things are going to fail and fade away to nothing. What really matters in life are the investments that you and I make in things that have eternal significance. When the EKG flatlines, when you breathe your last breath, when your heart stops, in that moment, all that will have mattered is what did you as a man invest in? Did you invest like the first Adam in the temporary or did you invest in the eternal? Did you love your wife well? Did you raise your children well? Did you leave a, grant, a legacy for your grandkids well? Did you build authentic friendships, meaningful friendships, where you poured into people and tried to show them the beauty of the Jesus life? Did you stand up for the weak and the oppressed and those that were in need in this world? These are the things that we must invest in that are of eternal significance. So, what I've tried to do here, leaning again to credit where credit is due on the 33 series material, we've tried to, to provide a, and build a clear definition of what it means to be an authentic man. An authentic man rejects passivity, which means you don't just check out. You stay engaged and you're active. You accept responsibility. You don't dodge it. You lead courageously. You don't pass the buck for somebody else. You be a man and lead courageously. And you invest eternally by not just looking at the immediate, but seeing the long game. Now, if we begin to see life through this grid, we begin to understand this is the operating system of what it means to be a man. The question is, are you going to embrace that view? And follow not in the shadow of the first Adam, but instead walk in the light of the second Adam, Jesus, who was a life-giving spirit from heaven, who led the way for you and me to follow. Jesus is the perfect example. You know, you may wonder, um, okay, so um, that's a really bizarre title for a men's curriculum, 33 the series. Originally, this material... Uh, came from an author where he called it the quest for authentic manhood. And the, and the authors of this material uh, got his permission and reworked the material and repackaged the material and, and built up the material. And they called it 33 the series. And you say, why would they call it 33 the series? Because of this. Their theory is this, and I think it's a, a true one. That the perfect example for you and I to follow about what it really means to be a man is Jesus Christ who lived 33 years upon this earth. So you follow in the steps of His example, those 33 years that He lived upon this earth. And when you do, that's a compelling vision for what it means to be a man that can define you and inspire you, and it is something that is worth fighting for. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you sent Jesus. There are so many images of Jesus that we might have in our minds that are false images of Him. Jesus was not some kind of weak, passive character. But instead we see in Jesus the reality of what it means to be a man. So help us, follow, Father, to follow in His light, in the light of His steps, 
and to reject being passive, to accept the responsibility that you give, and to lead courageously in our world and to take the long view by investing eternally. Help us to follow in His steps and be the men of authenticity that you want us to be. In His name we pray. Amen.